Hey, yes, sir. Questions about the, uh, some of the, about some of the what? The assignment or some of the grade. Okay. What questions? Uh, Why is he doing this? Okay, what are your questions? Uh, sorry, this walk on Why, 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 why? It's not. <laughs> All right. Um, why don't you see me after class? Because we've got a lot to cover today that I got to get through since we are behind. Because I had to take off last Tuesday since my mother was in the hospital. Um, we need to talk about the ethics and and the four P's. Basically, <coughs> a lot of the text involves other substantive areas of business that we've talked about. But because marketing is the only fully integrated function of the firm, I have attempted to intertwine marketing theory with those substantive chapters and talk about how marketing affects those issues. For example, there's a big recognition now, and we talked about this last time, that human resources is an area in which marketing plays a role because we want to get employees to engage in living the brand. And so... We know that employees and businesses that can get their employees to that point perform better on the whole than those that treat employees sort of like a cog in a machine. But this uh, class period, we will focus specifically on the four P's uh, of marketing. So we're going to talk about first product and price, and then I'll talk about place and promotion. The one that is obviously the most interesting for most students is the promotion because that's the part of marketing that everybody thinks of as marketing, right? Marketing actually started as a discipline in colleges of agriculture, and it looked at how we get goods and services, or goods, particularly perishable goods, to consumers in the most efficient way. Nobody thinks of that as being marketing. They think of being uh, advertising as being marketing because that's the part that we see and are exposed to on a minute by minute basis, right? So products and pricing. Pause the show right there so that it doesn't, well, it's not gonna say. All right, it's not gonna require a pause. Uh, in the 1970s, one of the cases that they talked about in an older version of the text, and it's actually one that I like more than the one that's in the newer version of the text, was a product called diethylstilbestrol. And what this did was it allowed women who were having a hard time carrying a pregnancy to term to carry that pregnancy to term. So there are a number of things that can affect an individual's ability to have a child uh, from a female perspective, not from the male perspective, but from the female perspective. There are women who simply don't are, are incapable of getting pregnant for a variety of reasons, genetic or environmental, maybe they don't ovulate. And then there are women who can get pregnant and their body spontaneously sheds the, the uterus, uh, the, not the uterus, it's the, the fetus. Um, so what will happen is they'll get pregnant and they will have a miscarriage very early on in, in the pregnancy. Their body doesn't produce some kind of chemical or hormone that allows them to continue the pregnancy. Normally, once you have a fertilized ovum that attaches itself to the uterine wall, the process and the hormones in the body that cause shedding of the uterine wall stop. That's not true for all women. So there's this class of, of women who are out there who can get pregnant. It's not that they're, they're not ovulating. It's not that they have endometriosis or something like that. 
which causes them to have problems with pregnancy. But once they get pregnant, they spontaneously abort the, the fetus. For most people, this is a fairly traumatic event. If you want children and you have multiple miscarriages, this can be a fairly traumatic deal. The pharmaceutical companies came up with this product, DES, diethylstilbestrol, and what it did was it allowed these women to carry a pregnancy to term. It stopped the shedding of the uterine wall. And so they were able to then have children. Now what happened is, and this product I think came out in the 1970s, what happened then much later in life is the female offspring of these children, and there's roughly a 50-50 chance of having a female or male offspring of these children, developed rare forms of fatal cancers in their 20s. And of course, they trace this back to their mothers having taken diethylstilbestrol. Through scientific analysis, they were able to say, like, there's these all these women, they're getting these very rare cancers. What could be the common thread? All of their mothers had problems getting pregnant, and they all took diethylstilbestrol. So it doesn't affect the male offspring of these women, only the females. And so naturally, these plaintiffs sue the drug manufacturer. Now, your argument in this lawsuit is predicated on the but-for test. But for the fact that my mother took this drug, I would not have gotten cancer. This is from classical torts doctrines in the law. Right? So we have substantive areas of the law, like criminal law is a substantive area, tort, which is civil law, which allows you to recover damages for injuries that you've sustained as a result of the action of <coughs> the defendant. And that's what they did. Under tort, we have you know, contract law and, and various others. So under a theory in tort called strict products liability, these women sue the manufacturer saying, but for your act of giving this drug to my mother, I would not have gotten cancer. Can anybody think of a problem with that argument? Yes. If it wasn't for the drug, they wouldn't have... Come to term. Yeah, if it wasn't for the... You're saying, basically, I shouldn't have been born. That's the argument you're making, is that I should not I, I should not have been born. Right? And most of us would say that some amount of life is better than no amount of life. Right? But that's, that's the argument, is basically, you gave me this drug, or you gave my mother this drug, and years later, I developed this rare form of cancer, which may be horrible. Cancer is a horrible disease in many respects. Or, you know, many types of cancer are pretty horrible. And you're arguing, basically, I shouldn't have been born. Now, what, would allow, what kind of ethical theory in the law would allow for that kind of insanity? <clears throat> Under tort law, what we generally look for is a wrong that we say is not, or it may be criminal. There may be a, 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 a criminal element and a criminal prosecution that can take place in tort, but we also allow for civil recovery. But there's lots of things that don't rise to the level of criminal behavior where we say, that's really bad behavior, and we're going to let you recover 
for it, even though it's not rising to the level of a criminal activity. So, for example, if I trespass on your property, generally speaking, and I destroy something, generally speaking, that's not criminal. No, now it may be. If you trespass long, it, there may be some criminal liability, but in, in general, that's not a crime. If I cut across your field and I destroy some of your crop in cutting across your field, generally we say, well, you shouldn't do that. You destroyed the crop and there's civil liability that attaches and not criminal liability. Now, there may be criminal liability and civil liability both that attach with other types of things. For example, assault and battery. We had a professor here at UCO who I tried to fire when I was associate general counsel who stabbed a student with a pencil. That's a crime. That's assault and battery. I couldn't fire. They wouldn't let me fire. It's also a tort, right? I think we all understand that. Like you did something bad and you should be held liable for that bad act. If I create a product that harms people because I negligently designed that product, well, maybe I should be held liable. So let's take, for example, the Ford Pinto. How many of you know what a Ford Pinto is? A couple of you know what a Ford Pinto is. That's, not many people know what a Ford Pinto is. It was this really cheap car that was manufactured by Ford. I believe that their goal was to manufacture a car that costs less. Now get this, you're gonna have to go back in time, a long time ago. <coughs> the goal was to manufacture a car that costs less than $2,000 that they could bring to market for less than $2,000. And they did. Turns out that if you were hit in the rear of a Ford Pinto, it exploded. The bumper went into the gas tank and the car would explode. And it turns out that Ford knew this. And they had determined that it was just cheaper to let the car go and pay because people who bought Ford Pintos generally those people who were, were willing to pay to the, you know less than $2,000 for a car are not the intelligentsia of our population. And so they could just pay them off. They could pay those families off cheaper than it was to recall the car and fix it. They did the calculus <coughs> on this. They could just <clears throat> pay the people off and it became a pretty big issue for Ford. I think we all understand that, right? Like Ford was a bad actor in that case. But how do you get from that to we're going <coughs> to impose liability on you for these female offspring of mothers who took this drug in the 1970s to carry a pregnancy to term and it doesn't affect the mothers. The mothers didn't get these cancers. It was their daughters that got these cancers. That's really attenuated, isn't it? And under classical torts doctrine, that kind of attenuation generally wouldn't be allowed under the reasonably foreseeable test. So there's a case, a very famous case, called the Falls Graph case, Falls Graph versus Long Island Railroad case. And that talks about, and I think it's P F A L S G R A P H versus Long Island Railroad. That case 
involves a woman who is injured by the act of a railroad employee. And what happens in this case is there's a man who is running to catch a train and he's carrying a package under his arm. The train is leaving the station and he needs to be on that train. So he jumps aboard the train as it is pulling out of the station. One of the pursers on the platform gives him a little shove to get him on the train so that he doesn't fall off the train. He drops the package that he's carrying under his arm. It contains explosives. Those explosives go off and the reverberation from the explosives cause a scale at the other end of the platform to fall and hit Mrs. Falls Graf in the head. And she sues, of course, the railroad under the but for test. But for the act of your employee, I wouldn't have been injured. And that's the test. It's a but for test. But what we come up with in tort is, as a result of that case and some others, we come up with two types of causation. You have cause in fact, and proximate cause, which is legal causation. Yes, but for the fact of the, the purser pushing this gentleman onto the tracks, Mrs. Fallscraft wouldn't have been hurt. But if you look at that, that is such a crazy fact pattern that would anybody have reasonably foreseen the consequences of that act. No. And so the court says there isn't enough. That's too attenuated. And we're not going to hold the railroad company liable for Mrs. Falls Graf's injury. Because that's, that's just, that's too crazy. Now, given that case, why is it that these plaintiffs even think in the diethyl still bestrol case that they could sue the drug company? Because who would reasonably, when we do drug trials, we don't generally say, is this going to affect future generations? We looked at whether or we look at whether or not it's going to affect that person who takes the drug and whether or not they're going to get some kind of cancer and die, right? Well, because we've become such a complex society, there has been a area of tort law that has developed, that has gone beyond negligence. <coughs> so tort law historically was predicated on this idea of negligence and this but-for test. <coughs> what is negligence? Well, negligence is a theory where we say, look, you have a duty You have a breach of your duty. The breach of the duty leads to injury. And that injury is the, has been caused, it's the proximate cause of the injury. So you have duty, breach, injury, cause. I can breach my duties all day long, and if you're not harmed, there's no tort. I can drive recklessly through the parking lot every day, like I see you all doing, as you're scrambling to get here at the last minute. You drive like bats out of hell and pull into the parking lot and are running to class. And if nobody gets hurt, there's been no, even though I breached my duty or you breached your duty, there's no injury, right? Well, we get to the point where in this world, as we have become less rural, more urban, and more complex, 
that we've started to say, well, there are some injuries that you didn't necessarily breach your duty, but who's in a better position to pay for the pain and suffering? And we come up with this doctrine of strict products liability, strict liability. Strict liability now says, if you manufacture a product and people are hurt, even if you didn't breach your duty, like the case of diethylstilbestrol, you're going to be held liable. Now, what theory could be used, what ethical theory could possibly be used to justify strict products liability? It's the reason that your car is no longer $2,000. You cannot buy, I mean, if you buy a car for $2,000, I'm going to, first of all, it's going to be an old car. I don't know that there, there are some car manufacturers in the world that manufacture really cheap sort of disposable cars. Um, I believe they're mostly in Asia and they look more like a tricycle than a car. <coughs> they're three wheel sort of vehicles that are kind of enclosed, I guess. You can find them in, in large cities in, for example, in China. But in, in the United States, you're not going to buy a new car, certainly, for $2,000. And even if you buy a used car <clears throat> for $2,000, I, I would be very skeptical of what you're going to get. Now, my, my colleague, Stacia Workray, who used to be the department chair before I became department chair, she won't pay more than $5,000 for a car. She buys old Volvos and she'll only pay $5,000. She, she's gone through a lot of them. Um, I've ridden in several of her vehicles. I don't know that I would, I've gone like from here to the fairgrounds. I don't know I'd go further than that in that vehicle. I think I would avoid going to, you know, like a long road trip to Santa Fe, New Mexico or something like that in any of her vehicles that she has. Why is it that you are so taxed when you go buy a car? Well, it's largely as a result of strict products liability. We, cars have become, if we had similar decreases in the cost of a car compared to computing power, what would we be paying for a car? Well, Price Pritchett suggests that if we had had similar decreases along with technological advances in the auto industry, as we've seen in the computer industry, that a car should cost about you know, $500, run on a thimble of gas, and go for thousands and thousands of miles. And that's not the case. Why is it? Well, largely because of strict products liability. When I was a kid growing up, cars, most cars, in particularly in the back seat, didn't have shoulder harnesses. They only had lap belts, which are wonderful for keeping your little body in place, but they will cut you in half if you're involved in anything over a, a collision over about 15 miles an hour. They can, they can cause extreme internal injury bleeding, right? So we now have all four seats in the cars now have shoulder harnesses and lap belts. All of them have multiple airbags, which the first airbags, the first generation of airbags, if you weren't, I was, the first generation of airbags were statistically designed for me. When they first came out, I was 5'11". I think I've shrunk a little bit because I've had a broken hip. And you do shrink as you get older, by the way, your, your bones compress, particularly your spine, and you lose about an inch or so. So I'm probably about 5'10 now, but I was 5'11", and I weighed 150 pounds forever and ever. And that's who the average uh, air, airbag was made for. For those of you who are females in, in the class, the first airbags, if you were like about 5'8", which I think was the average height of a woman at the time, and less than 150 pounds, it'd just pop your little head off. You know, that airbag would deploy and it'd just snap your little neck. send it flying right back and maybe decapitate you. <clears throat> Oops. They don't do that anymore, right? I mean, we've got side airbags. People don't die in automobile accidents the way they did in the early 2000s, for example. 
So we've got, you know, and all of this costs money. What's the average price of a, of a new car today? It's over $25,000. The average new car price is something like $25,000 today. And $25,000 is nothing to pay for a car. A Cadillac Escalade starts at about $100,000. Mm -hmm. The price of what you could buy a house in many Oklahoma communities is what the price of, of a Cadillac Escalade is. Why? Largely as a result of strict products liability. What strict products liability says, it's predicated simply on utilitarian principles. So it is purely utilitarian ethics at play here. Who's in the better position to pay if you are injured by something like diethylstilbestrol? The drug company or you? Okay. The drug company. Right? The drug company is in a better position to pay than you. It's, it's purely utilitarian. Who's in the better position? Who is... It, who, who will suffer less? Now, what it has done is drug companies now pass the cost. One of the reasons that we can now cure, for example, it used to be that if you contracted hepatitis C, you were going to die of hepatitis C. They now have a cure, not just treatment, cure for hepatitis C. What does that cure cost? When it first came out, half a million dollars for the cure. For one course of treatment, half a million dollars. We all bear the cost, right, of strict products liability. But it is predicated on purely utilitarian grounds. What's wrong with this? Where is the cursor? So we went from, in the olden days, a theory of caveat emptor, which was let the buyer beware. If you went back to the early part of the 20th century, all sorts of people traveled around the country selling snake oils and things that would make your hair grow or whatever. Um, and we said, that's just, if you're, if you're stupid enough to buy that, you're, you get what you pay for. So we went from caveat enter to a theory of negligence, which involves duty, breach, injury, and cause, to strict products liability, which is purely utilitarian, right? Negligence is predicated on duty ethics, right? We're going to identify duties, things like you shouldn't stab students with pencils. Now, I want to stab some of you with pencils from time to time. But I, I shouldn't, right? That's bad. Even though you fall asleep in my class and I'm sort of morally offended by that because I am, in fact, funny. I had somebody write my student evaluations. You're not very funny. Yeah, I am. Right? Like, uh, <laughs> I, I, I just shouldn't do that, right? So we went from caveat emptor to negligence to strict products liability, which is purely utilitarian. So negligence is predicated on duty. Strict products liability is predicated on uh, utilitarian principles. What about ethics and pricing? We generally operate in this country off of free market principles, which is that if I have something, I can sell it for the price that I want. And the idea is that the free hand of the market will determine the price of a product and that those people who are most willing to pay will put the product to the highest and best use. Now, what happens in a free, if you have completely uncontrolled capitalism, is you end up with things like monopolistic pricing, where you'll have one company that will control the entire market. One company will get so big, they will buy out everybody else, and you'll have monopolistic pricing. This has happened throughout history, you know, starting with Standard Oil, they would go in, and they would say, we want to buy your little gas station, or we want to buy your oil well. And somebody would say, you know, Farmer Bob or Joe, uh, <clears throat> Joe's service station would say, I don't want to sell. And Standard would come in, they'd put a gas station across the street, they would drop the price and put you out of business. 
Walmart basically did this in small towns, right? When I was a kid growing up, this was a huge, huge issue. I remember when the Walmart came to Guthrie and people were upset because it was going to put the downtown merchants out of business. They couldn't compete with the low prices that Walmart offered. You also have issues with price fixing. That's where we get together if we don't have a monopoly, but we get together if you have an, olig uh, an oligopolistic type market and you fix prices. The entire time my brother was in school at Stillwater at OSU, there were two guys who owned almost every gas station. It's no longer the case. Every gas station in Stillwater. And the prices for gas in Stillwater, Stillwater is not on I-35, so it's kind of off. It's about 15 miles off of I-35. And the price of gas in Stillwater was always 25 cents higher than it was in the rest of the state of Oklahoma, where we produce gas. Because basically, are you going to drive 15 miles and then another 15 to some place to get cheaper gas, right? What about price gouging? Well, you know, the hurricane comes through and you own a lumber store, all of a sudden the price of things like, uh, all of a sudden things like a uh, price like um, plywood go up, right? And then issues of predatory pricing. This became a huge issue with the subprime mortgage industry. These people were going out and selling second mortgages when the, when the interest rates were really low to people who couldn't afford to pay them back, doing non-conventional loans on houses, using stated value and stated income, rather than looking at what the house was actually worth and what people could actually pay. You could write down anything that you wanted. In the past, if you wanted to get a mortgage, if you went back to the 1980s and you wanted to get a mortgage, what would happen? Well, it was what was called a fully documented loan, which meant that your banker required that you provide them with three years of income tax returns, three years of bank statements, and three years of proof of income. So your 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 paychecks for three years. And then they would go one step further. They would go to your employer and they would say things like, can you certify that Mr. or Mrs. X works for you and that they're likely to continue working for you in the future? They would talk to your employer. They don't do that anymore. Now, what it did is it stopped a lot of people from getting loans but it also prevented a lot of bankruptcies, right? Rather than me just saying, oh, I make $100,000 a year <clears throat> and this house is worth, you know, 350,000. How many of you watch like the, the home buying shows on HGTV and stuff like that? I'm sort of fascinated by these. I, I, I'm like constantly interested in these, these people. It's like, what do you do? My wife is a stay-home mother, and I'm a red centipede farmer. What's your budget? A million dollars. What? Yeah, I mean, like, it, it's just fascinating to me. I didn't realize that the red centipede market was, you know, booming. <laughs> I, I, I'm, you know, it's like, I'm a part-time substitute teacher, and my wife homeschools our children. We want a home in for in you know the five hundred thousand dollar range. On a lake. Yeah, yeah. on a lake <laughs> with a view. Uh, what? No, crazy. But that's what has happened as a result of you know things like predatory pricing and predatory lending. So these are enormously complex issues. Context is enormously relevant. And we have to think about the integrated nature of marketing when we, when we consider the ethics of these kinds of, of issues. I'm gonna go to 
let's see. Promotion in place, hopefully. Yeah. So things like direct to consumer advertising of pharmaceutical products. We are one of only two nations that allow direct to consumer advertising of pharmaceutical drugs, for example. And I think there are both benefits and disadvantages to this. I think I've told you all that my father was an FBI agent. He was a special agent in charge of the Santa Fe field office for the FBI for many, many years until he retired. At the time he went into the Bureau, they had everybody meet the director of the FBI who, when he went into the Bureau, was J. Edgar Hoover. If you had ever been seen by a psychiatrist or a psychologist, that was an a priori bar from obtaining a job with the Federal Bureau of Investigations. You could not get a job with the FBI if you had ever seen a psychiatrist. Now, mind you, they would have you see a psychiatrist to make sure that you weren't mentally unbalanced, but if you'd done it on your own, that was a bar to getting a job with the federal government. Our understanding of mental health has increased dramatically in the last 20 years. <clears throat> it used to be that people viewed that if you went to a psychiatrist or psychologist as you're crazy. We no longer view it that way. And I think direct consumer advertising of things like Prozac have helped with that. Now, it's also created some problems in that, as a society, we now think of, because of direct consumer advertising of these things, we now think of everything as being fixable by a pill, right? We go to the doctor and we want a pill for every single thing. If, if we have this problem, we think we need a pill. It's one of the reasons that we have an opioid crisis in this country today. And the, the pharmaceutical companies did it. They pushed Oxycontin, right? Nobody should be in pain. The problem is that it's highly addictive, right? So we have, we have, as a result of direct consumer advertising, we have become aware of these things. It's no longer the stigma that it once was. However, it's also led to bad results in that we think that we can fix issues with a, with a pill. These issues also lead to issues of autonomy, right? Issues of whether or not, and the, the test here for autonomy is, is the will overborn? And I think this is harder to determine than you would think. Let's take an example from criminal law. In a case called Florida versus Bostick, the Supreme Court says that this is what happens in this case. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you an example of how much the court believes that you have free will, and I'm not sure that you do. In Florida versus Bostick, the Florida state troopers decide that they're going to undertake a drug interdiction campaign. They decide that drugs are being moved by Greyhound bus by people putting it in their luggage and moving the drugs as part of a network. So this is the way the drug industry, the illegal drug industry works, right? There are people at the top who we can call, these are like CEOs, and we can call those people kingpins. And that's what the Racketeering Influenced and Corrupt Organization Act deals with, is like trying to get the kingpin. So there are people like El Chapo, you know, and Pablo Escobar, 
who are the kingpins of these drug organizations, the Medellin drug cartel, which manufactured the cocaína. Under these kingpins are lieutenants. And there are lieutenants that are in charge of things like, these are like, would be like a vice president of finance. The vice president of finance is the money launderer guy, right? Who's responsible for cleaning the money. So that, it, you know, illegal money comes in and then you wash it and you launder it by putting it through legitimate businesses. And those are like the vice presidents of finance. There's also like a vice president of distribution. These are the logistics officers, right? Who make sure that the cocaina goes from Colombia to Sinaloa. And from Sinaloa, it is distributed out to Los Estados Unidos, the United States, right? So there's these logistics guys. So there's finance, logistics, right? Then you have, you know, like somebody who's a vice president of basically marketing, you know, finding people to get the word out about your product. Under the vice presidents of logistics and sort of marketing, the, the under the vice president of, of you know, the, the, the lieutenant, not the VP, they, they call them lieutenants, under the, the lieutenant of, Finance are people called Smurfs. Right? You all don't remember the Smurfs. It was a cartoon that used to be on. There were these little blue people that ran around <clears throat> and tried to escape Gargamel. So there are these Smurfs. The Smurfs run around and help clean. They, they make deposits into banks and small amounts of money. Right. So these are the this is the this is the street level sort of people. Under the vice presidents or the lieutenants of distribution and marketing are the street level pushers who sell product to people. So there's these these structures that are very much like a legitimate organization in the drug world. Part of these people, so the state of Florida decides that part of these people, these, these dealers, and maybe some of the Smurfs and some others are moving products and money. One of the things that you can look at is, because this is largely a cash business still <coughs> to this day, when they exchange the cocaina for cash, some of the cocaine gets on. If I brought a drug dog in here, and, and most of you don't have cash in your, I mean, in your wallet anymore. But when I first started teaching, lots of people had carried cash. You used to carry cash, you know, at least a quarter so that you could make a phone call, right, from a pay phone. If I brought a drug dog in here, I'd be willing to bet if some of you had cash, the drug dog might hit on you because as they're taking the money for the cocaine, you know, it's, it's messy. The cocaine's on the table and you've got piles of cash. You're weighing it out and right. Got this. So they decide that they're going to interdict these drug dealers in Florida on these buses because they get these people to, to put the stuff, the product in their, in their suitcases and move it. So the police board buses without warrants and they go up and down the aisle while they're holding an M16 rifle in SWAT gear with all the indicia of, you know, paramilitary sorts of operations. And they ask people, can I search your luggage? 
And the court engages in what I think is an intellectual daisy chain fantasy. And they say, everybody knows a question is a question. And so they should know. Now, this man is standing, you're sitting in a seat. This man with a fully automatic weapon is standing over you and asking, can he search your luggage? And the court says, of course, everybody knows that that's, and the will is not overborne. There's no overbearance of the will. Because we all know that a question is a question and that you should be able to refuse because you should know that he's asking you a question. Now, let me ask you, do you think that that's what the average person thinks? The average person sitting in a, in a bus seat, and if you're traveling around on a Greyhound bus, I'm going to suggest to you that you're not the intelligentsia of our society, who is well trained in Fourth Amendment jurisprudence, is going to think that I have no ability. It's the reason police pull you over, and and they will ask you, can I search your car? You have the right to say no. You, you know, I, I won't give you a ticket if you let me search your car your answer should be no, right? But most people don't know that. Most people don't know because we're a polite society. I used to I used to give this example. When I was associate general counsel here, I had a secretary. I no longer have a secretary. Even though I'm department chair, I have, we have no administrative assistant. Every other department on campus and every other college has their own administrative, not, not in the College of Business. I'm not at all bitter. <laughs> about that. But I used to have the secretary. Her name was Brandy. And every day after class, I would come in and I would say, Brandy, here's my roll sheet. I used to take roll before COVID. We used to do this. We used to take roll every day, right? And I'd pass the roll sheet around. And you all would sign the roll sheet. And I would take it in. And I'm lazy. And I would say, Brandy, would you mind putting this in D2L, in the, in the great book on D2L? Actually, when I started doing this, it wasn't. I kept it on a spread, like an Excel spreadsheet, because we didn't have D2L. And she would say, sure, Dr. Grantley, I would be happy to do that. Now, is that a question or is it a command? It's a command. I phrased it like it's a question, right? But if she had said, no, Dr. Grantley, I don't want to do that, she could have gotten her ass up and gone and get another job, another job, right? Mm -hmm. that, that's not a question. And the court engages in this intellectual day and says, no, nah, the will's not overborn. What about less subtle issues? Is the will overborn in advertising? The issue here is one of autonomy. Right? If you are dying of cancer and you see the ads for CTCA, which has now gone broke, right? Are you making an autonomous decision? Let me see if I can find the Peggy ad from CTCA. They pulled this ad, but well, I think it's because they've gone broke. How did they go broke? There's no donations? Uh, they were they're a for-profit hospital and they had horrible results and they've gone broke. Mm -hmm. Let's see.
I would suggest to you that if you have cancer, don't. Well, I, I think they're gone now. But uh, go to MD Anderson, right? <laughs> like not CTCA. But is the will overborn? If you are, are you making a rational decision? If you're diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and you see that that ad, are you making a rational decision? Or are you making an emotional decision? I think you're making an emotional decision. I think the will is absolutely overborn. Now, one of the things that your text talks about is it says that autonomy is not something that you have one moment and not the next. And I don't know that that's true. Can you make, for example, an autonomous decision an irrational decision in one area of your life and not in another. I think you can. I think you could be perfectly rational if you are, for example, a business person and you're looking at whether or not and trying to evaluate whether or not you should buy a piece of property for your business. You could evaluate that rationally while in your personal life, if you're battling cancer, not make rational decisions. Right? I think that the will can be overborne as a result of context in one area and not necessarily in another. Does that, let's see. With regard to- This is the end of our- With regard to place, logistics and power in the channel. This one is one that seems less obvious to most students that you would have issues <coughs> in logistics. It seems to be fairly straightforward and less com complicated in terms of whether or not you have ethical issues, but you do. So for example, let's take Walmart. Historically speaking, all of the power in the distribution channel started with the manufacturer because the manufacturer set the initial price. And then each middleman in the channel added to the price that you would finally pay at the end because they added value. For example, utilities like time, place, and location, you know, utilities. So the middlemen get the product to you. Do you want to go to, for example, Hershey's, Pennsylvania? I, I, I don't know who makes Reese's peanut butter cups. Who makes Reese's? Is it a Hershey's product? Is it a Hershey's product? Okay, so Hershey's is manufactured in Hershey's, Pennsylvania. I've been there. Kind of an interesting thing. They have a <coughs> they <coughs> they have a Hershey's. Uh, this is not a COVID. It's an allergy problem. I took a COVID test this morning. Um, they have a Hershey's amusement park in Hershey's, Pennsylvania, where it's manufactured. You don't want to get all the way to to. Pennsylvania to buy your Reese's peanut butter. I love Reese's peanut butter cups, right? That's the only candy that I really like. And I think the reason I like it is it's not really sweet. I don't really like sweets. It's more salty than it is. It's more savory than it is sweet. So I love Reese's peanut butter cups. I don't want to go to Hershey's, Pennsylvania to buy my Reese's peanut butter cups. I want to buy them at the convenience store or the grocery store or something like that, right? Sam's Club. So all these middlemen add value in that the, the warehousers and the you know, truck drivers, the trucking companies bring these products to me where I want them. Um, but historically, the manufacturer of Hershey's set the initial price, and that was where the power res uh, resided in the, in the distribution channel. Walmart reversed that. Walmart, until very recently with the, with the advent of Amazon, was the largest retailer of soap, laundry detergent, dishwashing detergent, textiles, bedding, cleaning products, and even diamonds. They were the largest retailer of diamonds in the world until very recently. And how did they get to be that large? They reversed the power chain. Walmart started telling manufacturers what they would pay for a product. And there was an article that came out in a trade magazine called The Man Who Said No to Walmart. Almost everybody wants to get in to sell to Walmart. And this one company 
which was snapper mowers decided that they didn't want to sell to Walmart. Because what do you suppose the price point that Walmart wants to sell a lawnmower for? A push mower, your regular not riding mower, things like that. What do you think the price point is? Anybody got an idea? 200 bucks. Huh? 200 bucks. Lower. 150. Lower. 795? 100 bucks. 100 bucks? 100 bucks. That's what Walmart wanted to sell forever and ever. And that's still what they want. If you go to Walmart, you can find mowers for about 100 bucks. And they told Snapper, that's what we want to sell your mowers for. And Snapper said no. Because people, what, what happens with a $100 lawnmower? Well, it's going to work for about one season. And then, but they realized that their customers didn't care. That people who buy a hundred dollar mower, they buy it, you know, maybe they don't even own the house, they're renting, and they're gonna like, you know, get rid of it. Maybe not, they're gonna move into an apartment, or next summer they'll just buy another mower. You know, they'll spend another hundred dollars. And Walmart's pretty happy with that. Snapper viewed themselves as being higher quality and didn't want to sell for a hundred dollars. So they said no. About 10 years after that article came out, guess who started selling to Walmart? Snapper. Right? They decided that they wanted Walmart's business more than they wanted to hang on to their brand identity of being a higher quality. So they totally flipped the power chain. Now there are obviously ethical issues with this. If I own something, I should be able to say what I want the price to be. Now, who benefits from Walmart's aggressive tactics? Well, obviously we do. But at what cost? Right? To what other companies that have to, to make cuts along their manufacturing line that to employees pay and benefits that they offer to them? One of the reasons that Walmart sells so low and has been able to maintain such high margins in a notoriously thin margin area like groceries is because they do things like when, when Mr. Sam was alive, they actually offered benefits to their employees like health care. They no longer do that for most employees. They, they, they cut back on the number of full-time employees. And, and so they have greatly reduced, you know, their overhead costs, but who's ultimately paying for that when their employees get sick, because they don't have health insurance company or health insurance through their company, or they didn't at least until Obamacare. Obamacare changed a lot of that. Um, and Walmart has had to offer more and more people benefits. Who paid for it? Where did they go? Those people who are uninsured. Where do you go? If you don't have health insurance, you go to the ER because they can't turn you away. And who ends up paying for it? Taxpayer. We do. Right? It's a horrible way of providing health insurance. And so these issues that don't seem like they have ethical import actually have quite a bit of ethical import. Yeah, we all get cheaper, we all get cheaper lawnmowers, but are we ultimately ending up paying for it in terms of the taxes that we have to pay to support the populations that are vulnerable and are disadvantaged and taken advantage of by companies like Walmart? by companies like Amazon. Amazon is such a horrible, was until recently, such a horrible place to work because workers were expected to pull so many goods in a, in a period of time and it went up as you increased in your tenure in Amazon, that they were peeing in bottles and leaving them around the warehouse because they didn't have enough time to go to the restroom and maintain their margins. <clears throat> You know, efficient, we get goods brought to our door in two days or less, but at what cost on, on the human being? All right, so that is it for me. We, the exam, the final exam should be open and online for you. If you have any questions, please, email me and you had some questions that you wanted to answer if you got ducks today uh come see me let me spin this and turn the video on